Let me introduce myself and my colleagues. I'm Rishi Bidarkar, co-presenting this talk with Sunil Satnur and Banit Agrawal. We work for the performance team at VMware, focusing mostly on VDI performance. Uh, I'll keep the disclaimer slide up there for a couple of seconds. Enterprises are moving towards desktop virtualization. Everyone wants their own VDI infrastructure. I'm sure a lot of you here are deploying or, or have deployed VDI. Can I get a count? Can, can you please raise up your hand if you have already deployed VDI? Wow, that's awesome. Let me ask you guys, how's that working for you? L We know there's, there's a lot going on in a typical VDI infrastructure installation, and there are many moving parts. Let me explain. This is a typical VDI deployment uh, slide where you have your storage infrastructure, your network infra infrastructure that connects your storage infrastructure to the server and virtualization stack. Then there is your broker infrastructure that brokers your user connections to the desktops. Now, there are, these are the different components that make up the VDI infrastructure. We at VMware work hard to make sure that the low-level intricacies are abstracted well so that a typical admin can use better workflows to make these connections better. But a typical VDI admin needs to understand and have intimate knowledge of all of these components. Let's dive into it. The VDI admin has to understand storage performance. What I mean by storage performance is, what size of array would I want for my VDI infrastructure? How many LUNs? What kind of protocol should I use? Is iSCSI better, NFS, fiber channel? How do I decide? Then there is hypervisor performance. vSphere gives you tons of tools. And to highlight one of them, memory. Memory is a precious resource. You have to use it just enough so that you can get the best thing out of it. Memory overcommit is a really cool feature that vSphere gives you. How do I? size better with the memory overcommit. What number should I use? 20%? 30%? 100% of memory overcommit? How do I know what's the right number for my VDI infrastructure? Now, moving on, I'm sure you guys saw Steve's keynote where we, we are raising the bar higher with vSphere 4.1, where we support more number of hosts and clusters per vCenter. How do, I, how do a VDI admin use all that into his infrastructure to make his deployment the best? Then moving on, you also have view performance. There is a lot of virtual machines powering on and off during your regular day-to-day regular -day life. You want to make sure that your configurations don't interfere with your users itself. How, how do I avoid bootstorms? There are ways to fine tune all this in view as well. So you need to understand all that. Then, ultimately what matters is what your user is getting to see in, in front of him. What kind of display uh, performance he's getting. That's something you need to understand. Now, these are all the things that you know and have to understand. On top of that, it all has to work in harmony. You have to know how it ties in together. How do you do that? Well, folks, you are at the right place at the right time. The goal of the talk is to demystify VDI deployments. How do we do that? We do that two folds. First, 
we show you and teach you how to benchmark a typical VDI infrastructure. Then we go through these deployments and the benchmarking results to show how you can easily deploy your VDI infrastructure. Let me go through the agenda here and tell you exactly what I and my co-presenters will be talking about. I'll be going through some of the challenges again and take you through that. We'll talk about View Planner and what it can do for you. Take a deep dive and understand its features so you can better use it. Then Sunil will take us through some of the ways and methodologies that you can use View Planner for. And then Banit will take us through some of the best practices and some of the results that we have from View Planner and otherwise, from the other tools. All right. Challenges. There is a lot of activity going on in a typical VDI infrastructure. You need help with a lot of activities. Let's take one for example. For a typical VDI admin, the boss comes up and says, we need to virtualize 5,000 users. The VDI admin says, that's great, boss. And then he's also thinking, what does that mean? How does that translate into how many servers I want? What kind of storage do I need? How does it all tie together? You need help with scaling. Then many of you raised your hand when I, when I asked if you have a VDI deployment. You already have a VDI deployment. Your users are having great experience. It's all going fine. Somebody comes up to you and says, you know what? There's this new processor chip that's come out. It does great. How you as an admin can tell that if I move to that new architecture, I get better experience, better performance. How do you decide? And then at the end, when you all are, you have a great VDI infrastructure, how do you know that it's performing the best for your user? You have to fine tune it so that you can get the best out of your infrastructure. You need some sophisticated tools to do that. VMware View Planner. What is VMware View Planner? I'm glad you asked. VMware View Planner is a next generation VDI workload generator and sizing tool, which enables and helps you with all these use cases. Let's take a deep dive and see what it gives us. This is a typical data center view where you have your virtual desktops uh, on the storage. What View Planner does or has is a VDI workload which runs on these desktops. The VDI workload consists of daily user activity, like opening a file, closing a file, doing PowerPoint presentations, playing a video. All these are operations, maximize, minimize. These are the operations that are automated inside the virtual machine itself. It plays and then it does all this automation. And then, I'm sure there are a lot of people here who are, who are familiar with this. They have used workload generators which do this and maybe have a passive connection to that uh, workload or the desktop itself. I have to ask you a question here. Is that how your typical user is gonna interact with your desktop? Just sit there and watch what's going on? No. What your typical user is gonna do is use all the channels that are provided through the display protocol. Use the mouse, use the keyboard. That's exactly what is there in View Planner, and that's why it's the next generation workload. What we've done is we've used all these techniques and we control and execute the, the workload remotely. How do we do that? We use a unique technique for, called the watermarking technique where we get the latency measurements on the client side so that you can get the best for your users. Let me elaborate a little bit why that is more important. A typical VDI use case is not always about LAN. If it was about LAN, you would use any other workload generator and have passive clients and that would suffice. But majority of the, the scenarios 
have a mix, LAN, WAN, and extreme WAN. And you want to size your deployment accordingly. You want to have a proper mix and understand each user's ability or each user's experience. So that's what View Planner gives you. It will give you a good sense of how your WAN and LAN users perform. So moving on, of course you want to scale. It's VDI. You want tons of virtual machines. And what does that do? You need better management. You need a good, robust, scalable stack that can manage your VMs appropriately. And we have that in View Planner. We have a central virtual appliance which actually manages all this through the vCenter and View interfaces so that you don't have to do all these automated things. Now, you definitely don't want to get tied to one client on your setup. You want to run it from anywhere. We did that too. We added a web interface where you can log in from anywhere, do the runs, check the status, do the provisioning remotely as well. That helps with the central management and flexibility. Now, this is all that is packed into View Planner. You might be wondering, can I get this tool? Absolutely. We are glad to announce that we have a beta a couple of weeks back, and you guys can access that. Let's take a look at some of the features that the beta gives us. As I said, it's a virtual appliance. It's very easy to deploy. All the packages and binaries are in the appliance itself. It, it self, self deploys. And it has different components. It has a MySQL database. All the information, your state, your configuration, and your results are stored in structured tables. So you can go back and get your latencies or your state information out from the database itself. You have a web server where you can <coughs> log in through your web interface. And it also helps with web workloads that we have browsing and picture, picture browsing and stuff like that. It also integrates very well with the latest and the greatest vSphere. vSphere 4.x. We also are integrated with View 4.5 that, that will be uh, releasing soon. That was announced yesterday. And we have, in, we have integrated the tool very well with your Active Directory. I'll go deeper into the Active Directory in, in, in the following slides, why it is important and how it can help you guys. And then these are the operating system stacks that we support. As I said, we have a robust management layer which can help you do all these admin operations without you going and doing it yourself. Now, how do, you, how do I configure this tool? So there are only two profiles you need to understand. Workload profile and run profile. Let's take a look at what the workload profile gives us. The workload profile, first, you want to know what different applications are right for your environment, a representative set, so that you can, you can identify your users appropriately. What they use should be what you should be running with. Towards that, we have mined a lot of data, and we have come up with a set of applications which can be mapped to the representative set. We support Office 2007. And other apps. Let me take a, while, a, time, a little bit of time to talk about the video. It's pretty cool, guys. Video playback, video is, is, is a major workload. It, it, it taxes all your resources. And extending our watermarking technique, we can actually tell how many frames per second you can get on the client side. Not on the desktop where it is running, but on the client side. That is very powerful. Then you can appropriately scale with respect to how the users are actually seeing the video and what kind of performance and user experience they are getting. So that's pretty useful. Then you have a couple of more parameters that you can choose from. Number of iterations. You can select as many iterations as you want. Think time. Let's spend some time on what is think time. 
I said, we are not, we are humans, we are not machines, right? We don't keep going click, click, work, work, work. We take breaks, we, we think. So we have emulated that in our workloads where we have a pause of anywhere from zero to the think time at random, and then we do the operations on and on. So think time is configurable. You can select a think time. What we have seen is 20 second range gives you the best representation. So you can use that as well. And then you save the profile. The second profile I was talking about is run profile. So run profile should use the workload profile. Let's take a look how it uses the workload profile. In a run profile, first you decide how many VMs or how many users you want to be run on this, in this particular run. Then you figure out, you give the desktop names and view planner will automatically go to the data center in your V center and get all the VMs with that name and then run the workload on it. Then you, you select a type. I mean, you have a choice of being passive, local, or remote. As I, as I, as I explained, why these modes are important. Remote will give you the best user experience uh, metric. And then local is also used for storage and platform characterization. You can use that for that too. Then you select your display protocol if it is a remote or passive uh, type. Then you add your AD groups. So I, I said I'll explain why AD groups is, uh, is important, right? You, in, in a typical enterprise, you have different groups. You have sales, you have marketing. You want to be able to represent them very well. And you want to make sure that the workloads you choose for them are representative as well. So we added that interface to the AD for you. So when you select the AD group and the percentage of VMs, of the total VMs that you want to run this workload on, it will do that for those many users. So for example, here you have 50% of the VMs running marketing workload and 50% of the VMs running sales workload. There are two different workload profiles with different applications and you know, configurations there. Then you just save it and run it. It's as simple as that. Great, you, have ran, you, you did a run, you got your results, it's in your database. How do you analyze that, right? Let's take a look at view panel reporting. So a typical, a typical run in view planner on, a part, on an iteration in, on a VM yields to around 40 measurements, latency measurements. Now you want to scale up the number of iterations as well as number of VMs. Soon you'll get a big set of latency measurements that you want to use. You need an easy and efficient way to translate these measurements. So we've done that. We have done that in a QoS metric. So the motivation behind this is you know you have different operations. You have open, close operations, which long, run longer based on how, how big your file is. And then you have fast-running operations, like maximize, minimize, or clicking, which is faster. So you don't want your long-running operations to overshadow your short, fast-running operations. So we have divided them into two groups, group A and group B, based on their characteristics. And then let's pick a group. And what we have here on this graph is we have plotted the latencies in an ascending order. You can see that there are two demarcations, one for 90th percentile and the second one for the 99th percentile. And we also set thresholds for those 90th and 99th percentile, T90 and T99. To give you an example, we ran two view planner runs, one with 500 users and one with 450 users. You can see that the 90th and the 99th percentile of the 450 
passed because it's below the threshold, and the 500 is failed because it's above the threshold. Now, the, the group will pass if both the thresholds or both the percentiles lie below their threshold. And for a complete run to pass, you need both the groups to pass the QoS metric. This will be more evident and you know, clear when Banit and Sunil will come up and present their results. So let me recap. You understand exactly the scope of VDI. You understand what are the challenges. You know that View Planner is there to help. And how to use View Planner. Now, I want to call Sunil up to the stage, and he will go through the different ways you can use View Planner. Sunil? Thanks, Ruchi. So, are you guys ready to see some uh, use cases of View Planner? Okay. So, you've learned what View Planner is, you've learned that VDI benchmarking is not very easy, and you need a sophisticated tool to be able to size your VDI environment. Now, what I'm going to do in the following few slides is to take you through some of the use cases of View Planner and see how you can use this tool to do various different kinds of sizing studies. So you can use View Planner for a variety of things. For example, you can use View Planner to evaluate the number of desktops per core. Now, this is a very fundamental sizing metric. So you have so many number of servers, and you get an idea of how many desktops you can run across all the CPUs combined. The other thing you can do with View Planner is to study the right level of memory overcommitment. Now, all of you want to implement this feature, but you would want some kind of guidance as to what's the right level of memory overcommit with the best level of performance. You can also study the number of desktops per storage device. Now, if you have your favorite storage device, from your favorite vendor. Now you have a certain number of disks and links. So how do you know how many users fit into this storage device? You can do that. You could also use View Planner to compare and contrast different CPU architectures. So let's say you have a slightly older Intel processor in your data center, and you are trying to evaluate that new processor on the shelf, like, like for example, Nehalem processor. How do you know how much better it is compared to your existing processor? You can use View Planner to do these kind of studies. And really much more. You can do a lot of different kind of studies with View Planner. But in the interest of time, I'll take you through three use cases. CPU, memory, and storage. OK, so now first let's look at the CPU sizing. So the goal of this use case study is to see how many desktops you can fit on a particular core. In order to do that, what, what we did was to boot ESX on a single physical core. Now, we did this on a processor which supports hyperthreading. So we played around with hyperthreading. We enabled it. We disabled it. We, we saw how much you can get with, in each mode. We steadily increased the number of desktops using View Planner on that one physical core. And at each stage, we, we measured the results using the View Planner reporting that Rishi talked about. So the setup that we had, we had a HP blade with an Intel Nehalem processor. We enabled only one core so that we can study how many desktops you can fit on it. We, uh, we studied both hyperthreading and no hyperthreading. We used a Windows XP guest for this. And as far as view planner goes, we enabled all applications and we used a 20 second think time, which we think is a typical think time for a, work, a video workload. OK, so now let's look at some results. So before I explain what you see in this result, let me take a few seconds or a few minutes to explain the outline of this slide. So what you see on the y-axis is a number between 0 and 5. So what it means, what that is, is the normalized latency. Now Rishi talked about the different groups and the different thresholds. For a VDI run to pass, we want all four values to pass. Basically, we have group A, 90th and 99th percentile. We have group B, 90th and 99th percentile. So we have four different values. In order to easily represent these results, what we did was we normalized these four latencies with respect to their thresholds. 
So if a latency is below one, that is the cutoff line that you see, that means that particular latency has passed its threshold, or QoS metric. If it is above one, it means that that particular latency has failed its QoS requirement. OK, so what do you see here? We steadily increase the number of desktops. You can see on the x-axis from 1 all the way up to 16. You can see that the last case for which all four latencies were below the line, the threshold line, was 10. So this means that on a Nehalem processor with hyperthreading disabled, we were able to get 10 VMs per core to pass, 10 Windows XP VMs. Now, this is very powerful. Now, let, let's see what we can get with hyperthreading enabled. So we did the same experiment with hyperthreading enabled. And here you can see that there are more number of VMs passing for the same workload, for the same desktops, just by turning on hyperthreading. You can get 40% more. That's what we were able to get. Now, we think that this is something very powerful. Just by running this workload in, in a given <laughs> configuration, on a given setup, you were able to determine that X number of desktops can be run on a particular core by still maintaining a reasonable quality of metric, quality of service metric. Now let's take a deeper look at why we got these results. So we used our favorite tool, ESXTOP, to measure the average CPU utilization of the CPU core when we ran View Planner. Now the average CPU utilization is plotted here. The blue ones is the no hyperthreading. The red one is with hyperthreading. Now you can see that you know for the 14 VM case for which hyperthreading passed and no hyperthreading failed, the average CPU utilization is very close. It's not too different. So why did hyperthreading do so much better? If we take a closer look at the CPU utilization, what we've done here is to plot the histograms of uh, CPU utilization values. We've divided them into five different buckets, 0 to 20%, 21 to 40%, and so on. Now, when you see the values lying between 80 to 100%, that's when you know that the CPU was really busy. So what we see here is that with no hyperthreading, the CPU was busy for 53% of the time. So just look at the last bucket, which is 81 to 100%. Whereas with hyperthreading, the CPU was busy for only 36% of the time. This means that the hyper-threaded processor was able to co-schedule the two threads efficiently at the same time. So just to recap, we just went through our first use case of View Planner, <clears throat> which is CPU sizing study. So the next thing we'll study is memory overcommit. Now, we wanted to study <clears throat> a big enough value. Like, so that, that's why we studied two times memory overcommit. So what did we do? We provisioned twice as much virtual machine memory compared to the available physical memory. We repeated the tests on both ESX 4.0 and ESX 4.1. We have some cool memory-related features in ESX 4.1 that can improve your memory consolidation. So we want to show it off a little bit. We also studied the various counters that we collected, like ballooning, page sharing, swapping. And in ESX 4.1, there is memory compression. So the setup that we have is the same machine, the HP Blade, the Intel Nehalem processor. We booted ESX with only 24 GB of memory. And as far as the VMs goes, we booted 96 Windows XP VMs, each with 512 megabytes of memory. So the total was 48 gigabytes of memory provisioned over 24 gigabytes of physical memory. That gives you a two times memory overcommit. And View Planner, we ran all applications with the 20 second think time. Okay, so now I know you're waiting to see the result. So here it is. So what you see here is ESX 4.0 compared to ESX 4.1. So the, we are seeing a similar uh, a graph here. The four, the four latency values and the normalized thresholds. So the overall result here, what you see, is that ESX 4.0 failed and ESX 4.1 passed. But if you closely look at the ESX 4.0 result, you'll see that it's not too bad because three of the four latency values are still below their thresholds. 
But overall, we say that the run failed. On the other hand, ESX 4.1 did well on all the four latencies. All four are below the respective thresholds. Again, let's take a closer look at why one failed and one passed. So the first thing that we're going to see is the amount of savings that we got with the various technologies that we have built in. So first of all, we have ballooning, which uh, you know balloons the memory from within the guest and causes the guest to swap out unused memory pages. The second thing is transparent page sharing in the VM kernel. So we identify pages that are similar and we share them so that we can sa uh, save some memory. And in ESX 4.1, we have a new feature called memory compression. So basically what we do is just before we swap a, a memory page out on, onto the disk, we actually try to compress it to at least half its size. And then if you look at the total of all the savings that we were able to achieve, ESX 4.0 was about 30.5 gigabytes. And in ESX 4.1, it was about 350 megabytes more. Might, might not seem like a lot to you, but it, this will make sense in the, in the next graph that I'm going to show you. So here, what I've plotted is the swap usage. How, how much memory was not being able to fit in the memory and was swapped out to the disk? So in ESX 4.0, we see that the average swap usage is about 300 megabytes, whereas in ESX 4.1, the average is about 100 megabytes. So this also gives you an idea about the working set of the VDI workload. So just by saving about 350 megabytes more, we were able to reduce the swap by one third. So that's a pretty good result here. So again, to recap, we saw how much memory overcommit you could achieve with this VDI workload. Now, your results might vary. I'm not saying this is what you will be able to get in your environment. So you can take the view planner workload, you can select all the applications, you can select the think time. You know, if, if your users are aggressive, you might want to give it a smaller think time. If your users are kind of slacking and coming once in a while, then it might be about, uh, then, then you might be able to go more than this. Okay, so now let's look at the next use case, the third one, which is the storage. So for storage, what we did was we, we had to test a lot of VMs because we had a, we had a big uh, storage array, and we wanted to see how many VMs we could fit on that storage array. So what we did was we took 512 Windows uh, 7 VMs, and we ran it on NFS. The sum total of all the bandwidth was 5 gigabits per second. We had five links in a LACP link, and we had about 26 disks. So this is the setup details. So what, what is the result with this kind of a setup? This is a, obviously a big setup with a lot of VMs in it. So here's the result that we got. So you can see that three of the four latency values have, have uh, you know, exceeded the threshold line. So this means the overall run failed. So again, we'll take a closer look at why this particular run failed. So the first thing that we want to see when we have a storage, when we think we have a storage problem, is we see the latencies of the particular uh, of the read and write commands being generated from the virtual machines. So on an average, we saw that the read commands are taking 71 milliseconds, and the write commands are taking 108 milliseconds. Now, do you think this is uh, low or high? Very high, exactly. So in a VDI environment, you don't want to see latencies as high as 60 or 70 milliseconds. You want it to be somewhere in the tens, you know, 10, 20 millisecond range. So the next thing that we did was to understand why we are seeing such a high latency. And also the maximum. If you see the maximum latencies, you can see that it's way above, you know, it's like 600 and 900 milliseconds. So then we wanted to see the link utilization. I told you we had five gigabit Ethernet uh, links. So was that a bottleneck? Not really. So if you look at the average link utilization, it was about 30 to 40 percent. So the links were not a problem. They were fine. What about the disks? Were the disks up to the load? Uh -huh, there you go. 
the disks are pretty much saturated at 100%. So maybe we needed faster disks or more number of disks, more number of LUNs that you could divide your virtual machines among. So again, to recap, this is a storage sizing study where you were able to figure out whether a particular number of VMs uh, can be supported on a, a storage device or not. So to recap the whole thing, we studied three different use cases of View Planner, CPU, memory, and storage. And at each stage, we saw that View Planner was giving you a consistent result, a consistently understandable result, whether the QoS was satisfied for that particular run or not. So with this, I hand over the stage to Banit, who will be going through the best practices and results that we obtained with View Planner. Uh, thanks, Sunil. So, so far we have seen uh, Rishi presented on how View Planner can help you, what are the features, how you can do the hardware assessment, and then Sunil presented some of the use cases of View Planner. How you can study desktops per core, how much memory overcommitment you need, or how you can do some storage experiments and do some troubleshooting. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to present some of the best practices that we have done, we have got using View Planner. So please note that while this is not the, this is just some subset of practices that you're presenting in the interest of time. More practices and uh, best practices will be available as white paper on the uh, VMware website. So I'm going to present the best practices at different layer, uh, different components of the virtualization stack. CPU, memory, storage, as well as at the guest and as well as the protocol level. So let me start and talk about the best practices that we got using View Planner at the platform level. So on the CPU settings, we have a parameter called halting idle millisecond parameter, which is configurable, and you can s uh, it has different effect on different kind of workloads. So we will see how this parameter affects View Planner workload. More details on this parameter is available on the cable link. The next best practices we have is you can do memory commitment going in vSphere, and in 4.1, we have the support of memory compression. As Sunil presented earlier, so this has also a lot of configurable parameter. So before a page is swapped out to the disk, the page is uh, see if we can compress that page. So you can have more confidence in doing memory overcommitment with this setting. And you can play around with different settings. And more details about this uh, memory compression is in the white paper. On the storage front, you can use v multipathing as well as you can use vStorage APIs, if available. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to present the results on the CPU, which is the HIMP settings, and how does this affect with View Planner on the VDI workload. So here, before going into the chart, let me explain some of the setup details. So we use a Nehlem processor, and the guest we have used is Windows 7 32-bit, configured with one vCPU, 1.5 gig of main memory, and this is on ESX 4.1 host. And here we have done 12 VMs per core. And in View Planner, we do support remote mode. And with the remote mode, we can actually connect with PC over IP or RDP protocol. And here we have connected with PC over IP. And we have selected all the applications with 20 second think time, as Sunil also presented some of the results earlier. Again, this chart, if you look, this is similar to the results we've seen earlier on when Sunil presented some of the use cases. So on the y-axis, you have normalized latencies. All the values ever one means that particular threshold has failed. If it is below one, then it means that we are passed on those thresholds. So if you look at the left one where we have default him, and on the right one we have him, which is set to zero, which means that we have disabled the him. So if you look at the results on default him, we see that the three threshold out of the fourth threshold has failed. But if you disable him for the VDA view planner workload, we found that all the thresholds have passed. So you may want to set the value zero. Again, it depends on your environment and setups. So you want to run View Planner and see how much improvements you can get by disabling this uh, HIMP setting on for the View Planner. OK, now I'm going to move on and move on uh, present some of the best practices at the guest level. So we ran View Planner, and we found out that for Windows 7 and Windows XP, one vCPU is enough for regular use. 
And if you want to run more CPU-intensive apps, as well as high-resolution HD videos, you may want to configure 2V CPU for your Windows 7. On the main memory side, Windows XP can be configured with 512 MB. But if you want more memory-intensive apps, you might want to configure 768 MB or 1 GB with that. Windows 7, 1 gig. But if you want more memory-intensive apps, 1.5 or 2 gig should be good. On the adapter side, make sure that you have VMX Net 3 as your network adapter. On the storage adapter, you can set it as PVSCSI or LSI Logic SAS. And also, we have run some experiment, and we found that if you keep your page file on separate disk partition, we have seen that you can minimize the redo log growth. And also, please make sure that you have the latest VMware tools installed. Now that we have looked into what the configuration you can do, now let's look at some of the settings or group policy settings that you can do with the guest. Again, this, some of these settings are based on your needs and requirements, based on what suits your environment and setup. So you can do, like, for example, you can do uh, disable Windows updates. So in View Composer, we have an operation called Recompose. So basically, if uh, Recompose, you can actually update the parent image, and you can recompose so that all the VMs or all the link clones will have the updated image. So you may want to disable Windows updates. Again, and then also you can disable Windows search. And then also in Superfetch, we found that five minutes or six minutes after the boot storm, you will see that it again spikes for the Superfetch operation. So you may want to also disable Superfetch if, again, all the settings that I'm, we are presenting, it's big, based on like whether you want it, like it suits your uh, environment. The next we have is the group policy settings. So you can disable system restore. You can see if you want to disable the screen saver as well as your wallpaper. And you can also configure your window visual setting to adjust for the best performance. And I'm going to present some of the results and how it can save some of the bandwidth for you. More details on the services, what you can do, what group policy settings you can do, will be available on the white paper on this link. OK, now we have configured the guests. Now let's move on to the provisioning part. So let's look at, so there are some parameters available on view provisioning. So you want, let's say you want to minimize the effect of bootstorm on your underlying hardware. So we provide two parameters, which is maximum concurrent provisioning operation and maximum concurrent power on operations. So you can set this parameter and you can reduce the effect of bootstorm if you don't want to boot, let's say, more than six VMs at one point of time. So you can use that. And on the right, you can see the one of the interface uh, of View 4.5. So there are a lot of improvements has gone in View 4.5, full Windows 7 support. And there are a lot of features that has gone in. There is a super session tomorrow. I will enc uh, encourage all of you to actually attend that super session and learn more about View 4.5. And for internal network settings, we have found that uh, if you are using RDP connection, make sure that SSL tunnel is disabled and also direct connect is enabled. OK, I'm going to switch gears and now move on to the protocols. So here I've given a comparison chart comparing PC over IP and RDP. And the network condition we have used, so a typical network condition, you usually most of the time, you are connecting from a remote uh, place. So for example, so in this case, we have used 300 kbps downlink, 300 kbps uplink, and 100 millisecond round trip latencies. So here, I, let me point out the strength of View Planner. So by using View Planner remote mode, actually you can compare the protocol performance as well under different network conditions. So here we have compared PC over IP and RDP7 with the help of View Planner. Again, we have used all apps of View Planner, and this is with 20 second think time. And this is with Windows 7 32-bit guest. OK, now let's look at the chart. So on the y-axis, we have remote latency in seconds. And we have picked some of the interactive operation in View Planner on the x-axis. So if you look at the results, the blue bar shows for the PCO IP, and the red one is for RDP 7. So if you look at the latency of some of the operations, such as PDF Browse and the IE Browse, as well as the PPT, where you do full screen refresh, we found out that RDP 7 takes about 1 and 1.5 second more time to render that particular image. So PCIP can, because of its progressive nature, it can get you the screen updates much faster than compared to RDP, because it employs better compression technologies. OK, so now I'm going to uh, present some of the settings that you can. So please note that the results that I presented earlier, PCIP and RDP 7 are where with default settings. 
You can even do more with PC over IP with some of the settings that we are providing with View 4.5. So since PC over IP is a progressive protocol, so it first builds to initial quality and then it builds to lossless. So how some of these parameters can help you? So for example, you have a shared link, and let's say you have 10 users sharing that link. You don't want other users to interfere the performance of the other users. So there are a few parameters that I presented here. So this parameter can be set using the ADM file in the connection server. So the first parameter, let's look at it. Minimum and maximum initial image quality. So let's say if we have minimum initial image quality at 70, maximum was 90. And let's say PCYP picks 70. So what does that mean is it's lower some of the 4.5 settings that we are providing with view 4.5. Since PC so is a progress first builds to so its initial quality and then it builds first builds to lossless and help you. How some of this, so for example, you link, you have a shared, let's say you have link sharing that, let's say you have link, you want other user link, you interfere, you want other user performance of the other users. The, so there are performance of the few parameters other users that I presented. So there are ADM file that can be set using the server. So the first parameter, let's look at it. Minimum and maximum initial image quality. Minimum, so let's initial image quality. have minimum initial image quality. Let's say if we have maximum initial image quality was 90 at 70. And maximum, and let's say PC one was 90, 20. And let's say PC one mean is it's 4.5. Providing with view settings that we are, since we providing with view. So is a progress. So, so it's initial quality. So it's first build switch lossless. How some of this lossless? How some of this you have a shared? So for example, you have a shared link, sharing that link, sharing that want other user link, link, interfere other users, want other user, other users, performance of the, the few parameters, performance of the, so there are other users. There can be, so there are set using the ADM file and server. There can be, and maximum, inter, let's look at it. Initial image code. Minimum, minimum and maximum initial image code. Initial image code. Minimum, have minimum initial. Let's say if you have 90. Maximum at 70. Initial image quality was 90. 20. And let's say PC, what mean is it's 20. Providing with view. What mean is it's providing with view. Providing with view. Settings that we have is a progress providing with view. So, so it's initial quality. So it's, so it's lossless. First build to lossless. How some of this you have a shared lossless. You have a shared, you have a shared. So for example, you sharing that, sharing that, sharing that link. Sharing that interfere link. Interfere want other user performance of the, want other user, other users. Few parameters. So there are few parameters that can be, so there are, so there are other users set using the, there can be ADM file and maximum in server. Inter, let's look at it. There can be initial image code and maximum inter, let's look at it. Initial image code. Have minimum initial, initial image code. Numbers 90. Have minimum initial 70. Numbers 90. Numbers 90. 20. Initial image quality. It mean is it's 20. Providing with view. Mean is it's, mean is it's 20. Providing with view, providing with view. Mean is it's settings that we are providing with view. Initial quality. So, so it's, so it's, so it's initial quality. So it's, so it's first build to lossless. How some of this you have a shared? So for example, you sharing that. So for example, you sharing that, sharing that, sharing that. Interfere link, link. Sharing that interfere, interfere. Want other users, other users. Few parameters there can be. So there are, so there are, there can be other users. Set using the. So there are, there can be other users. Set using the. There can be some server. There can be some server. There, let's look at it. And maximum inter can be initial image code. Numbers 90. Have minimum minutes. Have minimum minutes. Initial image code. 20. Numbers 90. That mean is it's 20. Providing with view. Mean is it's. Mean is it's. Providing with view. Providing with view. Providing with view. Mean is it's. Providing with view. Providing with view. Initial quality settings that we are. So it's. So it's. So. So it's. So it's initial quality. First build switch. So it's lossless. So it's how some of this first build switch have a shared. So for example, you sharing that, sharing that, sharing that, sharing that, sharing that link, sharing that interfere other users. Want other users? There can be few parameters. So there are, so there are other users. So there are, so there are other users. Set using the other users. So there are some server. Set using the server. Some server. There can be, there can be initial image code. Numbers 90. Initial image code. Have minimum initial image code. Have minimum. Minus numbers 90. That mean is it's 20. Numbers 90. Providing with view. Mean is it's providing with view. Mean is it's providing with view. Mean is it's providing with view. Providing with view. Providing with view. Mean is it's providing with view. So it's settings that we have. So, so it's, so it's, so, so it's, so it's.
so it's initial quality and lossless first build so, it, so it's how some of this sharing that so for example sharing that sharing that sharing that sharing that interfere link want other user interfere other users there can be so there are few parameters so there are so there are other users so there are set using the so there are other users so there are set using the and server set using the and server there can be some as 90 there can be have minimum initial image quality. have minimum minimum have minimum minimum as 90 20 Numbers 90. Providing with view. Mean is its numbers 90. Mean is its mean is its mean is its mean is its providing with view. Mean is its mean is its providing with view. So it's mean is its settings that we are providing with view. So so it's so it's so it's so so it's lossless. First build to initial quality. How some of this first build to. So for example, how some of this sharing that sharing that sharing that. So for example, sharing that sharing that sharing that link. There can be interfere. Few parameters. There can be so there. There are few parameters that are users set using the other users other users so there are so there are and server so there are and server there can be set using the and server there can be there can be have minimum minimum as 90 initial image quality have minimum minimum providing with view mean is its number as 90 mean is its mean is its mean is its mean is its providing with view mean is its mean is its providing with view mean is its mean is its providing with view so its settings that we are providing with view so settings that we are so its so its so its so its so lossless first build to initial quality how some of this sharing that sharing that how some of this so for example sharing that sharing that sharing that so for example sharing that sharing that link sharing that there can be interfere so there are few parameters few parameters other users set using the so there are other users other users so there are and server so there are and server there can be set using the have minimum minimum there can be some as 90 20 Numbers 90. Providing with view 20. Have minimum minimum. Providing with view. Mean is its limit. Mean is its limit. Mean is its limit. Mean is its limit. Providing with view. Providing with view. Mean is its limit. Mean is its limit. Mean is its limit. Providing with view. Mean is its limit. Settings that we are providing with view. So settings that we are providing with view. So it's so settings that we are. So it's so so it's so it's.